No. I cannot wear those damn teeth. Happy Halloween, everyone. Next we want to take a look at the next third of the Halloween special. Which is the top 30 creepiest moments in kids shows. Also, yes, I mean, costume this time. Yes, this is also necessary to put the camera on. This isn't in the rest of the video. I just need to show face cam, which, yep. So, I, why not? I found this in my closet. Might as well freaking put it on. This tie kind of sucks, but again, I haven't worn this in like three years, so. <laughs> what do you expect? And now, through the power of video editing, we're going to cut to the next sort of reaction. Okay, let's do that again, and also, why the hell am I wearing games? Let's try this again, shall I? Okay, we are back to part two. We got an hour left of this video. So inside out. Okay, I'll buy Pokemon cards. I still have a box in my freaking uh, closet. That will be in a future video. Um. Okay, let's get on to it. I still have my cape on, by the way. I can't really show it on the camera because my face cam doesn't work. I also want to point out, you know those teeth I put in? I put in my mouth for a second. These are really covered in frickin' saliva. Ugh. Terror Toad. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Rarely do the monster costumes in Power Rangers ever give off a creepy or disturbing vibe. They're usually unintentionally funny, if anything else. Well, Terror Toad is both funny and disturbingly creepy. Yeah, I can, I can in the 12th episode of the original series, titled Power Ranger Punks, the evil Babu slips a potion into Kimberly and Billy's drinks, essentially drugging them into becoming pompous douchebags. While these two are out of commission, Rita Repulsa creates a new monster to finish off the remaining rangers, the Terror Toad. The unnerving thing about Terror Toad is not only its unsettling design, but also the fact that he eats the Power Rangers and shows their faces on his stomach. The way he devours the rangers is so disturbing and grotesque. The disgusting use of his teeth and the gagging noises he makes don't do the scene any favors either. After eating both the yellow and black ranger, the red ranger is forced to face the terror toad, alone. Thankfully, Alpha and Zordon are able to cure Kimberly and Billy, allowing them to morph back into the pink and blue rangers to assist Red in his fight. Zordon informs them that in order to defeat the Terror Toad, they must cut off his horns and then attack the weak point on his neck. You're going to pay for this, and I'm going to start with you! Pink Ranger shoots arrows into his throat, freeing their other rangers, and in one final attack, they kill him by shooting an arrow in his mouth. The episode ends with them playing an innocent game of volleyball at the rec center. Talk about a tonal shift. Terror Toad never appears again, thankfully, with the exception of being in flashbacks. He was also the third monster to never be enlarged by Rita's magic wand. One of us, Jimmy Neutron. Season 3 of Jimmy Neutron was where things started to get weird. Not that it wasn't weird before, the movie had a giant alien chicken dragon for fuck's yeah, sakes. But that. the tone of the show for its final season got weird, even by its own standards. One moment in particular that highlights this tonal change is in the episode One of Us. The episode starts with Sheen telling Jimmy and Carl about a new show that he's been watching called The Happy Show Show. And they all should watch it because it'll make them happy. Jimmy ignores it and goes to do some weird prepubescent stuff on his computer like Photoshop him and his crushes heads into wedding photos. However, Sheen is relentless and will not stop bothering Jimmy to watch a show. Soon enough, Jimmy starts noticing that everyone is acting different. 
being uncomfortably friendly with one another. Libby, did you just turn some music off? Oh, yeah. Hello, Jimmy. I'm happy to see you. Did you watch the Happy Show show last night? His crush, Betty, convinces him to give it a go. So that night oh, he turns it on and is greeted by a kindly old woman named Grandma Taters. He watches 10 seconds of it before turning it off because it's just that bad and quickly puts it out of his mind. The next day at school, all the kids are desperately trying to get Jimmy to give it another chance. Betty asks him to come over and watch it with him. But as he heads over to her house that night, he sees her watching through the window and realizes that the show is hypnotizing people. Soon, the entire town is after Jimmy, trying to force him to watch a show. Luckily, Cindy, who just returned from a karate competition, has not been affected yet. So the two track down Grandma Taters to put an end to this. After defeating her, it's revealed that she's an alien, and there's actually multiple Grandma Taters. We'll be back. The Happy Show Show is actually a parody of a real-life Taiwanese children's show called Fruity Pie, which is a bit uncomfortable to watch in itself, but it is ultimately harmless. Nevertheless, it's unnerving to think of such an innocent show brainwashing people. Jesse's Nightmare and Michelle's Nightmare, Full House. If there's one show that definitely doesn't belong anywhere on a disturbing moments yeah. list, it's Full House. The show is a living, breathing Hallmark the card still looks the same. that doesn't seem to have a hint of malice or darkness anywhere in it. Well, despite all of that, it's on here for a reason, and those reasons are in the episodes My Left and Right Foot and The Seven-Month-Old Itch this Part 1. Both of these moments can be quickly explained away since they are dreams and therefore don't actually happen, but that doesn't take away how freaky they are. First up, we have Jesse's nightmare in the seven month itch part one. Jesse is annoyed by everyone being in his personal bubble and asking too much of him. Later that night, he has a nightmare where two Michelles enter the room and start demanding that he feeds them and changes their diaper. This was at a time in the series when Michelle didn't talk. So she was dubbed by Dave Collier, putting on an uncomfortable, squeaky oh, yeah, voice. Change me! <laughs> Feed me! Change me! Feed me! Feed me! Change me! Feed me! Change me! Feed me! Change me! Feed me! Oh my god, there's two Michelles. They're multiplying! <laughs> The rest of the family yeah, then shows up, making part. annoying and ridiculous requests with a fisheye lens camera focusing on their faces, distorting them and making them look very unsettling. Our second nightmare comes in My Left and Right Foot, where Michelle starts to get self-conscious about how her feet are growing larger. We're then treated to a nightmare where her feet grow to a ridiculous size on screen, accompanied by a gross stretching noise. And no, Dan the Schneider did not make this, in case anyone wants to make that joke. Feet continue to grow until they're the size of the entire room. The family is terrified, and the only reasonable thing they can think to do is tickle them. Michelle wakes up screaming, thankful that it was just a dream. She pulls away her covers to see that her feet are still enormous, much to her horror. Thankfully, that was a dream too. The Walrus, Pingu. You said no foreign shit. Fine, we'll count this. This was also in the character. The Walrus is a very mysterious character only appearing once in the entire series in the episode Pingu's Dream. Oh yeah, my video got freaking copyright claim from us. Throughout his dream, the walrus follows Pingu in what he thinks is a playful manner. To Pingu, however, this is very frightening and upsetting, given the size and demeanor of the walrus. When Pingu meets the walrus at first, he pops up from the scenery abruptly, snorting with a deep voice. 
He traps Pingu under an igloo and then stretches and squeezes him for his amusement. <laughs> Afterwards, he takes Pingu's mattress and starts eating it. Why he eats the mattress is beyond us. After slowly walking away, Pingu then books it and runs until he slips and falls down an icy slope. He falls and falls until he reaches his bedroom floor. Turns out, the slope was just his bed sheets. Pingu's mother then coddles him as he sobs and tells her all about his terrifying dream and the walrus that stalked him. The walrus is a disturbing character thanks to his mostly silent demeanor. He is either staring uncomfortably with his dead black eyes or childishly snorting when he takes his playful jokes too far. He also has strangely realistic human teeth in place of tusk, not helping the situation. The walrus was so uncomfortable for children that the episode was actually placed on an unofficial ban from broadcast distribution. Wow. It was removed from British television in The episode you were trying to watch has been removed from circulation due to complaints from viewers. 2003 and was pulled from airing in the United States. It also was never released on VHS in the UK. Despite the censorship, it did manage to air once on PBS Kids Sprout in 2006. Wow. There was actually an earlier version of this episode that featured the walrus roaring and making disturbing squealing noises. This was changed to laughter because of how frightening the noises were to children. To end this entry off, here's an uncomfortable scene of the walrus speaking German in the creator Otmar Gutmann's showreel. Zombie Grandpa. Hey Arnold. Really? That's freaking that well in the In the episode Part-Time Friends of Hey Arnold, both Arnold and Gerald decide they need part-time jobs and decide to start working together at Miss Vitello's flower shop. At first, the boys are delighted to be working together, thinking of all the fun they'll have. However, soon Miss Vitello gets injured and leaves Gerald in charge of the store. Oh, Arnold finds that Gerald is far better friends than he is boss, and they begin to fight. Arnold quits, and the two vow to never speak to each other again. Later that night, Grandpa Phil tells Arnold about how he and his friend Jimmy Kafka had an argument when they were kids, and led to them never speaking again. The words haunt Arnold all throughout the night, eventually leading to a nightmare. In the nightmare, Arnold and Gerald run into each other on the bus 70 years later. The two still won't talk to each other, but have forgotten why they even started fighting. Suddenly, the distorted voice of Grandpa Phil taunts Arnold from the back of the bus, saying, What did I tell you, short man? We see the disgusting, rotting corpse of Grandpa Phil, laughing at Arnold until his jaw falls off. What the hell? Why did that need to be there? It certainly does its job by scaring Arnold into forgiving Gerald and helping out with the shop, but why is Zombie Grandpa such a dick? And why is he on the bus? Where is he going? I guess we'll never know. Frankly, we shouldn't know. The Haunted House, Samurai Jack it's difficult to classify if Samurai Jack truly is a kid's show or not. The first four seasons aired on Cartoon Network and while it was violent, it was never too much to cross over into the adult territory. Of course, season 5 changed all that with blood, swearing, and other adult themes airing exclusively on Adult Swim. Given the more subdued tone of the first four seasons though, and the fact that many children watched it, this moment from the season 3 episode Jack in the Haunted House deserves to be on the list. While alone at night, Jack encounters a sobbing little girl. She runs away as he approaches her, and he follows her to an old house. While in the house, Jack experiences several visions of the people who once lived there, and the monster that attacked them. Jack soon finds the girl and suggests they leave, but then finds that all the doors and windows have disappeared. With nowhere to go, the two decide to rest. When he wakes up, 
He finds the girl missing and hears music and chatter in the distance. He enters a well-lit room and finds the girl sitting around a table with the other family members. At first, Jack is wary, but is soon calmed by tea and small talk. The facade doesn't last for long though, as the brother's eyes roll up slowly into his skull. The music becomes distorted and flashes of the room's true state of dilapidation begin to seep in. The brother hunches backwards and begins drooling excessively. The mother and father then do the same. A shadowy substance bursts out of their mouths, destroying their bodies and turning into a demon. In the end, Jack defeats the demon and sets the family members free, but that happy ending does not erase the horrific tone and setting for the majority of the episode. Everything in this episode feels off, from the lack of background music to the way the demon is animated. The fact that we never learn who or what the demon is, or where it came from is equally unsettling. Unlike a coup and the other villains, the demon is given absolutely no comedic moments. Count to ten with nobody, Sesame Street. Oh, this thing. Most shows on this list have been aimed at kids around the age of ten. While still children, they are this capable of handling I mean, scary on. moments from time to time, but what about a show aimed at preschoolers like Sesame Street? The character Limbo, also often referred to as Nobody, was a Muppet Let's who disappeared that. almost as abruptly as he was introduced. He was made up of two floating eyes and a mouth over a black Looking background, really speaking with a deep a and show. calm voice. That's ten. Once again, let's count to ten. That's not bad. In Come Sesame on. Street, he appears to teach children about counting. He wasn't initially created to be on that show. Yeah. Jim Henson originally created Limbo yeah, for his surreal short film titled Limbo, The Organized Mind. Let, let me show you how it's done, in case you want to try it. This is a little more disturbing. Now, when you first come to the brain, you have to pass through the medulla oblongata. That's where things like breathing and the heartbeat and the glands are controlled. It's... Where the character talks about the human subconscious over images of fog and cockroaches. Why he made the switch to Sesame Street is beyond us. Maybe Henson doesn't want his puppets to go to waste. It is pretty cool. I, however, do not think that this is something that two-year-olds want staring into their souls. What if they said this is from 1971? Or 1970, you know, they kind of... It's not like this is going to be on here today. This was only like very, very, very early on in the show, so... Again, times have changed. The Mask, uh, okay, Goosebumps. I suppose with a series like R.L. Stein's Goosebumps, some scary and disturbing moments come with the territory. However, the events that occur in the episode The Haunted Mask are notable for being that episode. Every series has one, the one episode that fucks you up, even if you're already expecting something scary. Based on the 11th book in the series, The Haunted Mask is a two-part episode that follows Carly Beth, a girl who is sick and tired of being seen as timid and scared. With Halloween coming up, she refuses to wear the cute duck costume her mother made for her, and instead looks for something truly terrifying, in order to get back at her friends and anyone else who has made fun of her. At a mysterious costume store, she finds an absolutely grotesque mask that she is certain will scare the fuck out of her friends. The creepy storekeeper won't sell her the mask, but to be fair, he does offer her a gorilla mask, but she ends up stealing it and running out of the store. After she puts it on to scare her brother, she finds that it takes a while to get the mask off her face. She also finds that the mask has made her voice more grisly and menacing. The more and more she puts on the mask, the more it begins to take over her body. 
she becomes a completely different person while wearing the mask, and even attacks her own friends, eventually point where she cannot take off the mask at all, as it has fused with her face. She goes back to the costume store, but the shopkeeper says that removing it is no use. Only an act of true love can remove the mask, and she's running out of time. You'll awaken them. What's this happening? What are they doing? A bunch of other disgusting masks in the shop begin floating in midair and then chase her out to a nearby cemetery. She then realizes that the act of true love that can remove the mask is the equally ugly and disturbing mold of her head that her possibly psychotic mother made for her. You know, because love, I guess? Earlier that evening, she buries it in the same cemetery that the masks have chased her to. Long story short, she exhumes her replica head, and apparently it's so fucking creepy that the evil floating disembodied masks that are chasing her get scared off. Her own mask then comes off and Carly throws the abomination near the door, instead of fucking burning it. Her having something cling onto your face is not a pleasant thought, especially if it's something that slowly takes over your body. Masks in general are made of latex, smell gross, and irritate the skin. Imagine one stuck on you, sucking the life out of you. That's probably the furthest thing from a pleasant thought as you can get. Well. Boris and Linka's drug addiction, Captain Planet. Despite being brought up in previous videos on this channel, it would be criminal to not talk about the episode Mind Pollution from Captain Planet on this list. This episode feels so real compared to many of the other entries on this list due to how it mirrors the fears many of us have about our friend, family members, or anyone that you know that has suffered through an addiction. A villain named Verminous Scum is selling a highly addictive drug called Bliss and Linka's cousin Boris becomes addicted to it. While Bliss is a made-up drug, it's a simple pill that one takes, making his connection to real-life drugs evident. <laughs> Maybe so Nothing can bring you down now. <laughs> Boris becomes agitated and arrogant and eventually slips a pill into Linka's food, causing her to become addicted as well. Eventually, the Planeteers have to fight off a Bliss-addicted crowd Desperate to do anything that scum says for more bliss. Linka, stop taking that stuff! It's poison! Oh no, Willa. I need bliss. Without it, you cannot imagine the pain. I need more. During the chaos, scum gives Boris a whole bottle of bliss in exchange for killing the Planeteers. He promptly downs half the bottle and overdoses. Dying almost immediately. This killed him. I'm sorry. No. You are lying. Boris! No. It's me, Linka! Wake up! Linka. He's dead. No! 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 Oh, Lila! <laughs> While most of the commentary about drug addiction can be a bit on the nose, as is the way with many PSA episodes of older cartoons, the parallels to real life drug addiction is rather haunting. Seeing a main character like Linka become pale, with sunken cheeks and baggy eyes is disturbing and upsetting. Bliss seems to be related the closest to meth, or little, similar to the adrenaline. Frybo, Steven transforms into cats, and the cluster from Steven Universe. Steven Universe is a show known for pushing the boundaries of what is commonplace in animation. But with that, we see the darker side, the more disturbing and terrifying aspects. In the episode, Keeping It Together, we are introduced to gem mutants, hunks of cracked gems cruelly put together and forced to fuse. When they take on the physical form, they appear as a deformed, disgusting creature, looking for more gems in order to complete themselves. Upon seeing them for the first time, Garnet has an emotional breakdown, stating that They were forced together. They were forced to fuse. This is wrong. I I'm sorry. No, no, Garnet! You're coming undone!
So yeah, essentially, rape. This is increased tenfold later when we meet the cluster, the final product of the gem mutants. This is made up of thousands and thousands of broken gems at the center of the earth. They are constantly in pain, screaming and arguing eternally. So moving away from moments that are showing the darker sides of social elements, there are a few moments that are just downright scary in their own right. In the episode Frybo, we get treated to the character, well, Frybo. The fast food mascot was creepy enough already, but then it becomes sentient. It grows veins and tentacles and begins force feeding people french fries. When attacking or in pain, the noises he makes are just downright demonic. Thank god we haven't seen them since season 1. Last, but certainly not least, are the calf fingers. In this episode, Steven tries to hone in on shape-shifting abilities by turning into a cat. Since he is still pretty new at this, he is only able to turn his fingers into cats at first. Things get out of control, and the cats begin growing out of every bit of his body. Eventually he becomes nothing but a blob of cat mass. I mean, yeah, it's a little silly, but the thought of being consumed by anything, even cats, is just disturbing. Even Steven sounds mortified. Since then, Steven hasn't really messed around with shape-shifting anymore, and that's probably for the best. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna end it here, and then we're gonna react to the next part. Uh, I'm gonna end the video here, and we'll have a longer video, so... See you guys for the next video. What are we doing next? Speed Demon. Powerpuff Girls. Okay, we get to see uh, Satan next. See you guys for the next part. Don't forget to look at